and delighted to see such a large audience. This is kind of an unusual topic and, and we really didn't know what to expect, but we're very, very happy to see all these smiling faces. Um, I would like to introduce Stephen Taylor, our speaker for this evening on Whorehouses. <laughs> Well, thanks for the invitation to come over to Hartford this evening and to be with you. Uh, I'm a little off the reservation. I live over in New Hampshire. I live in a little town called Plainfield. Now, I travel around New Hampshire a lot doing talks, and uh, <clears throat> I always have to start off by saying, how many show of hands ever heard of Plainfield, New Hampshire? Let's see it. Yeah, I got a few here. I don't see anybody <laughs> having a hand up. Oh, well, it's over below Lebanon. It's right over there. And actually, from parts of Plainfield, we can see parts of Hartford. And uh, we have some lovely views off in this direction. Most of the good views in Plainfield are towards Vermont towards Heartland and uh, Mount Scotney and a little bit of your country. Uh, uh, usually the, I get a long-winded uh, introduction and there's one on the internet that people borrow and it's terribly embarrassing to me for this reason. It goes on and on about all the things I've done and uh, it, uh, it calls me, uh, uh, at the end, it calls me an independent scholar. And uh, uh, I got to tell you how I, that came to be. Very embarrassing. Uh, I, I used to work for the state government. I had worked there for quite a number of years. I was a commissioner of agriculture. And when I retired, uh, I was home working on the farm with my sons. And uh, a few months uh, of doing that, uh, one day I got a call from the State Humanities Council. And they said, we have a stable of speakers that travels around the state and does lectures and presentations. And uh, uh, we're a little thin on rural culture and, and the history of agriculture in New Hampshire. Uh, would you consider doing a talk? And I said, mm, yeah, I could do that, I guess. And they said, all right, we'll send you some paperwork that you've got to fill out. And then you'll have to have an audition. All right, I'll take it. Well, the paperwork came and I sat down to start uh, filling it out. And I got to the line that said, what is your terminal degree? Uh, oh, I said, this is a problem right here. Obviously what they wanted was a PhD or at least a master's degree. I barely got my bachelor's degree down at UNH. And I said, obviously I'm not qualified and I laid it aside. A couple weeks went by, gentleman called back. Where's that paperwork? Got to have it right <laughs> off. And I said, I don't think I'm qualified. I'm sorry. He said, what do you mean? I said, I don't have a PhD, I don't have a master's degree. Ah, he said, don't worry, we'll call you an independent scholar. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's how this got started. And of course, uh, around our farm there in Meriden Village, anytime I foul something up, my boys will say, independent scholar. <laughs> anyway, um, well, I, I, I want to tell you I have a great deal of affection and fondness for Hartford and, and especially White River Junction uh, because uh, for six years during my college days and around that time, I worked at Swift and Company down on South Main Street. Mm -hmm. Some of you will remember, I think it's now a place that deals in used uh, doors and that kind of stuff. What is it called? Co co cover. Yeah, there you go. Well, it was a brewery for a while. And then, but before that, it was a, a branch house of Swift and Company, which at the time was the biggest meat packer in the country. And uh, it was quite an experience. Uh, it was the late 50s, early 60s when this, this area all was dominated by general stores and small neighborhood markets. And uh, uh, they all got a side of beef a week. And uh, the beef would arrive and there would be four rail cars at 5.30 in the morning on Monday that had to be unloaded. And I was one of the grunts that unloaded the rail cars. And, one car would be all steer beef, and that would go to First National stores. And then there'd be a carload of cow beef from Minnesota or someplace. And that would go to these little markets. And uh, there were still uh, some of them in Lebanon and Claremont, Springfield, where they still spoke French, or uh, in Claremont or Springfield, spoke Polish. Uh, and then the second car would have uh, uh, lamb and veal 
and the third car would have uh, pork loins and barrels of barrels of pork liver and barrels of tripe. Uh, okay, you know, and well, reach down in, pull out a bunch and weigh it out and all that. And then the fourth real car would have would have butter or cheese or, you know, some interesting uh, product. And uh, it was a wonderful time. We had some great character. I bet there's some people in this room that remember some of them. Uh, it was uh, the superintendent in the, in the uh, main part of the plant was a character named Harry Mooney. And he was from up here in Wilder. And he always called me Stephen, as I, he didn't like to wear his false teeth. So he always called me Stephen. And it was a guy named Ken Aldrich. Uh, but somebody would know him. He was from right around here in Hartford. And he was a great collector. And that guy, he collected bottles, you know, and all kinds of stuff. And after he died, they had an auction, and it took like two days to get rid of all, you know, box trailers loaded with all this stuff, and they sold it all off. Well, those were the days. It was a, a fun time, and uh, I uh, and much of other uh, parts, many other parts of of uh, Hartford, are very very f appealing, and I'm very fond of the Dothan district in Wilder and and Queechy, although. Queechy, as I loved it, uh, was Queechy Fells Farm and the Dupuis, and uh, it was a beautiful farming country. Uh, you know, I don't object to Queechy Lakes. It's what people wanted and they're willing to pay. It's all right, but it was better back in the day. As I'm concerned. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, I'll hear from some lawyer or something. I better be careful here. <laughs> anyway, so I... I, I for the infestation. Yeah. For the infestation. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, it's good. Yeah, well, it's interesting. Hartford, uh, Plainfield's a little bit like Hartford in it. It's got these distinct uh, neighborhoods or areas. And uh, for many years, they, they just were sort of independent, you know? Uh, in Plainfield, uh, we had four different telephone exchanges. We still do, but until about 1980, it was a toll call, any one to the other. <laughs> and uh, then we had eight different mail addresses. We only had two post offices, but we had eight different mail addresses. And where I grew up in the western part of town on Freeman Road, uh, right next to the river, uh, my address all, all the time I was growing up was RFD2, Windsor, Vermont. And RFD2 was made up at the Windsor Post Office, and the mailman drove through the covered bridge, and he delivered around in North Cornish in the southwest corner of Plainfield. I was a student at the University of New Hampshire. Every year I'd have to get an affidavit that said I was a New Hampshire resident because they wanted to get me for out-of-state tuition. Uh, but that, that was all right. I mean, I lived with it. It was okay. But anyway, so we had these uh, neighborhoods, and over the years, we ended up in Plainfield with two of everything. Uh, two granges, two libraries, two schools, two fire departments, two PTAs, two churches, you know, all this stuff. And it's taken years and years and years here in the, in the modern times to kind of break that down. We finally built a central school. And, and part of getting the central school built included having a town office in the central school. Because everybody thought it was about time we did because our town clerk, up until 1973, his office was in a little cubby in between the woodshed and his kitchen. All right? And he didn't keep office hours. If he was there and you were there, he was open. And uh, you know, it was unbelievable. People would come at 11 o'clock at night and want to get a marriage certificate or register a dog or a Sunday morning. I mean, you know, it was just crazy. I don't know how he stood it, but he was town clerk for 58 years, and uh, we miss him terribly, but he did a great job. So anyway, uh, we've, we've sort of come together. Of course, we were always a farming town. Today, we're a, we're a bedroom town. It seems like everybody works at the college or the hospital or whatever and I respect those people they work very hard they're very well educated they're very well paid uh, but they're wonderful customers for local agriculture because we got some wonderful farm activity in Plainfield and it's uh, supported by these people with the means and the interest to make it happen and so that's all to the good anyway well I'm kind of wandering around here I better get get busy people say this guy's crazy um, don't want to have that happen uh, so anyway, I, I started doing the talks for the Humanities Council. The first one I did, uh, it's like it's out of print now, but I could still do it if somebody wanted me to. But uh, it was about the great sheep boom 
and its enduring legacy on the landscape. And you look at the numbers of sheep that were in Hartford, Vermont in 1835. It will absolutely blow your mind. There were probably about 12,500 sheep. Uh, it, it's just incredible. And on the other side of the river, the same. Hanover had 12,000 sheep. If you showed up in Hanover today with 100 sheep, they'd lock you up. You know. <laughs> and Lebanon and Plainfield and Heartland and, and, and uh, Springfield, Weathersfield, all up and down in this area. It was, it was an incredible time. And the legacy, of course, of the time is all the stone walls we find in the woods. Those were built to keep sheep in, uh, and the architecture. A lot of the nice buildings were built with money that was in the economy because people were making money, doing well with the wool business. And uh, anyway, and then I talk about a social uh, legacy was after the Civil War, there was no agricultural prosperity to compare with the fortunes that were made in the first half of the century with sheep. And so began a great exodus of population out of rural New Hampshire and Vermont. It was horrendous the way people left. If you had the railroad, you had mills, you didn't have the tremendous population loss. But you go to Plainfield, New Hampshire from 1860 to 1890, lost 30% of its population, 40% of its tax base. People just went away and abandoned farms and went back to trees, went back to the Indians, as they say. Well, I was doing that for a while and I, uh, started running into grumpy dairy farmers. They said, how come you don't do a talk about cows? And okay, so we did one about cows, how cows nurtured New Hampshire and New England for 400 years. And uh, then I did one on the Grange Movement. The Grange Movement was a very powerful political force in both New Hampshire and Vermont. And they accomplished so much for the good. And they had tremendous membership the, 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 in, at its peak in both states. There were 30, 35,000 people were members of the Grange, so it was a potent political force. And then I knew one about the one-room school, the district school, and that is pure fun, because there's still some people that went to one-room school. I went to a one-room school for a while, uh, and then moved to a two-room school. The only difference was that uh, we had a flush toilet in the, in the, in the, in the two-room school. Uh, and uh, <laughs> lately, I've been, doing, I've been doing this one about poor houses and, uh, and another one about the, uh, the decisions that were made in Concord, New Hampshire in the 1950s about the location of highways when the great highway boom was getting going and the effects on towns and whole regions of the state today. And I have a bunch of examples, but the one that has the most punch is where would Interstate 89 go? Yeah. <laughs> All right, when you get to exit 9 in Warner, New Hampshire, you go straight ahead. But you could have gone shop to the left because people in Claremont, people in Rutland, they wanted it to go south of Mount Sunapee over to uh, Claremont, cross the river, go up the Black River Valley to Rutland, then up through Middlebury and Virgins to Burlington. And they fought and fought and fought to have that happen. And then look what happened. It came this way because there were some people in the background that made sure it came this way. Senator Cotton. And uh, James Cleveland, Congressman, New London. Norris Cotton, United States Senator, Lebanon. Lane Dwinnell, Governor. Lebanon, Carl E. Kelton, White River Junction, Chairman of the Vermont Highway Board, Dartmouth College. Dartmouth usually gets what they want. Yeah. What about the going through Montpelier because it was the capital? Well, yeah, that was that was a good argument. I mean, that's yeah, yeah, yeah that's. But they, Vermont kind of got the jump. They they built 89 from Burlington to uh, to Montpelier kind of a hit while this was still playing out down here. But anyway, look at what happened. Look at the prosperity in, in Hartford and Lebanon and Hanover and Norwich, and then go down and look at poor Claremont. I mean, it, you know, it's just, it, it, it's oh, yeah, just. I'm from Claremont originally. Yeah, but you were in Claremont the in, the, stores, the, in the glory days when you had yeah. the joy manufacturing, 1,000, 1,500 good high paying jobs. 
Well, I remember those no. stores. <laughs> well, yeah, all right, but I mean, so anyway, well, let's get busy on the poor houses here, doesn't it? We're going to be, we'll be here all the wasted. I'm filibustering on you. I'm sorry. Don't want to do that. Uh, anyway, um, here's, how, here's how I look at this, and I ask you to, to think about it as, as I talk about it, uh, that uh, there's some enduring themes that trace way back to the Middle Ages about the subject we're going to look at, all right? And I'll try to point out where these themes kind of get going and how they endure down through history. Um, go back to 1349 in England, they passed a statute in the English Parliament that uh, prohibited giving alms, in other words, assistance, to able-bodied poor. That was the first theme, right off quick. We do not want to give assistance to people who should be able to care for themselves the able-bodied people. Uh, 1496, uh, in England, they said, every beggar unable to work shall resort to where he last dwelled or was born, with penalty if not, of three days in the stocks with bread and water, and then be turned out of town. There's a theme. We export the problem. Send it somewhere else. And we still try to do that. that, that but some of the examples of that impulse are uh, pretty ridiculous uh, when we uh, look at them today, but it was serious business down through history. Uh, up until 1600, about the only relief given to the poor in England was afforded by the churches, uh, although elsewhere in Europe the nobility, uh, the, the, the kings or whatever would uh, use public resources to help the, the, the poor in many instances. Um, the uh, coming of Henry VIII, he confiscated church property and uh, he abolished local government and threw the, everything into a tizzy. Fortunately, 1601 begins the reign of Elizabeth I and England begins to change a direction. The first act was the, the poor law, the poor law, which imposed a compulsory tax for maintenance of the poor. Um, there's a theme and say, you know, we've got this problem and it should be addressed by everybody. We all should have to contribute to uh, caring for the needy in our midst. Uh, uh, the initial law made no distinction between what they called the vagrant and vicious poor and the helpless and honest poor. But they went to work very soon to, to sort that out. The vagrant and vicious we're going to make them work, and we're not going to help them if we can avoid it. Uh, but we, we recognize we need to do uh, something for the helpless and the honest. Beggars and vagrants and those who harbor them are to be severely punished under the law at that time, even hanged. Can, we, can you imagine? Subsequent laws would, as I say, separate the poor, innocent, sick, and diseased from those lusty, of strong limbs, strong enough to labor. The former should be provided for, and the latter should be kept in continual labor. Well, that's what they said in England. Well, in my research, I, uh, uh, it, it's a little hard because in the 1600s they didn't keep very good narrative type records like we might expect later on. But in 1657, Portsmouth, over on the seacoast of New Hampshire, adopted an ordinance providing that any person taking in a border who might need assistance, uh, any person doing that would hold the town harmless for their support. In other words, don't look to the town for help. But that soon proved untenable. It could not. Uh, it was obvious that the town needed to help and uh, would provide, re called on to provide basic provisions uh, for the poor and uh, also medical support. Can you imagine what that would amount to? Uh, by 1690 in Portsmouth, a list of the poor being uh, boarded in the town was growing and there was a rising concern about the cost of, of uh, uh, this aspect. 1711. Portsmouth votes to build an almshouse, a f believe, uh, overseen by the selectmen, believed to be the first real almshouse in the United States. In other words, a place to put the poor people. And now there's a theme right there, aggregating the poor, bringing them to one place, having them all together, 
congregated at one location. And we'll see that theme down through history here. Uh, provincial law required suppression of common beggars, settling, the, putting the poor to work, and also passed a tax. Can you imagine New Hampshire passing a tax? <laughs> they did uh, to support paupers. And that's the first statewide tax in New Hampshire. Um, people are pretty surprised when I talk about the highways. And I tell them, when you go buy some gas in New Hampshire, you don't pay any gas tax to the state. Ha, 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 ha. What you really, what it's really called is a road toll. All right? That's how they got it passed in the legislature in 1923. <laughs> they called it a road toll. It's not like down at Hooksville where you throw money into the little lady in the booth or you go through the thing and the computer does it, uh, a road toll. Well, there's still a man in state government called the road toll administrator and he gets money from the petroleum distributors to build the highways and plow the snow. Uh, you know, this is New Hampshire I'm talking about. Uh, uh, you folks, mm, we understand. you gotta, you know, you, I know you're all shaking your head. What the heck is this? It's so crazy. Well, hey, first statewide tax in New Hampshire is to help with the poor people. And idlers and loiterers and disorderly people are to be put to hard labor. Well, that's what they set out to do. Well, as, uh, as land is cleared and settlement moves inward, see, we're about 100 years ahead of the settlement of Vermont, um, coming from the seacoast in, and then gradually up the Merrimack Valley. And then Vermont and western New Hampshire gets settled in the 1760s uh, and on. Uh, so it was, you know, we're, we're about a, a century behind here behind where they were over on the seacoast and in, uh, around Exeter and Hampton, Portsmouth, down that country. <clears throat> but anyway, as the land is cleared and settlement moves uh, inland, uh, the, a, a common method of supporting the poor is by a practice called boarding out or having the person bound out. And essentially what it was was an auction where a human being was put up at town meeting usually and um, potential bidders were asked, this old lady here needs to be cared for. Who will do it for the least amount of money? Okay, she'd be auctioned off. Or here's a big strong guy, uh, he's missing a few things up here, but uh, who will take him and how much will you pay to bring him to your farm and feed him and give him a place to sleep and have him work on your farm? What's it worth to you? You know, it would be worth $2 a month or something. You, if you, you, you're the winning bidder, you do, you pay, and the town gets the money, okay? Uh, and that's the way it was done. And this was done until the eight, middle of the 18, uh, 1815, 1818 time. And this was uniform all over New England. This isn't just New Hampshire and Vermont. This is all over New England. And I'll, in a few minutes, I'll talk about what came to be known as the New England method of dealing with the poor. And so this was sort of the forerunner of it. Um, anyway, another thing that they tried to do, and they did frequently, was something called warning out. Uh, the selectmen say, mm, we got some new people over here, and it doesn't look like they've got any assets or resources, and they may become a, a burden on the town. Let's just get them out of here. There's a theme. Ship the problem somewhere else. Let somebody else worry about it. Get them out of here. And here, here's from Rygate, Vermont. I'll read you. Aha. Uh -huh. They called it a precept. And uh, it says, this is in the county of Caledonia. Uh, we, and, and this is addressed to the constable in Rygate. It said, you are hereby commanded to summon this man and his family now residing in said Rygate to depart said town. Hereof fail not, but of this precept and your doing thereon, this return should be made according to law, given under our hands at Rygate, 1811, James Esden and Alex Henderson, select men of Rygate. The precept was read in the hearing of the person or the head of the family who might become a town charge, and that person or family should not 
thereafter claim legal residence or be entitled to support. This process was profitable to the town officials as the constable received a shilling for serving the warrant and six cents for each mile traveled, while the town clerk received a shilling for recording the precept in the constable's entry of service. I mean, they're just the same. We don't care where you go, but get out of Rygate. You just go, get gone. And uh, and some of the others it talks about, uh, if if you don't voluntarily get out of town, you will be carried out of town. I don't know. They put them in the back of a wagon and drove to the town line and said, "Jump out. That's it. You're on your own, or what?" But I mean, that's what they were doing. You know, it's horrible, cr cruel. Okay. Well, here's a, here's a couple, uh, John Alexander and Anna, his wife. Well, uh, this is in 1783, want to depart within 20 days under penalty of being carried out, John and Anna. We will hear no more of them in, in the official records. Presumably, they went out and stayed out. <laughs> 1787, two families were warned to depart, uh, but there's not much uh, in the record until about 1810. From that time to 1817, the law in Vermont was changed as it was in New Hampshire. There were 77 such warnings. One of them includes 11 persons. And uh, it's noticeable that there were only three Scottish names in that list. This is Caledonia County, you know, it's everybody, you know, it's, it's all Scott people up there. Uh, but further down, it says uh, in, another, uh, asp in another paragraph, several uh, pages later, I got a kick out of this. It said, these Scotchmen are known for uh, excessive consumption of, uh, of spirits. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so anyway, we're warning out people, uh, we're getting rid of them, shipping them out. That's another thing. Uh, but then if uh, they could uh, make a case that they've got a settlement, that they were somewhere else and had, you know, put down some roots, um, they, they had kind of a leg up, particularly after 1817 when the laws were changed about this warning out business. And so then... Uh, began uh, a long and sordid time of log rolling and feuding between towns about who was liable for the care of uh, uh, indigent people. And it was all based around settlement. How do you acquire settlement? Well, that's where you were born or where you lived for five or six years. And it was, it was all squishy. It was all subject to interpretation exactly how you establish settlement. But you, you went to great lengths to prove that your settlement wasn't here. It was somewhere else, okay? And this would persist all the way to the 1970s in New Hampshire. Vermont reformed that in, uh, in the 1960s, great reform, when the state took over most of responsibility for welfare. Uh, but in New Hampshire, uh, it is said that more money was spent on litigating settlement than was spent on support. And in some towns, they said, you know, rather than trying to sue the next town over this, it would probably be cheaper just to give some money to the people, which they need. And anyway, but to give you an illustration of how absurd this whole exercise was taken, uh, the distance that it was traveled to, to try to uh, get rid of a problem uh, involves my town. And I'm ashamed of, to say that about 1814, there was a cluster of three families that were chronic calls on the town. They always needed assistance. And somebody came up with a brilliant idea. Let's buy a farm and set those people up on a farm. And they can grow their own food. And if they work hard, they'll have surplus potatoes to sell and they'll have a little money. And this will be way better than what we're doing now. Great idea, the selectman thought. Well, they went and they bought a farm. Guess where? Columbia, New Hampshire, 110 miles to the north. <laughs> so they moved those folks up there. Well, within about a year, the selectmen began receiving letters from the selectmen of Columbia. <laughs> oh, we got some of your people up here, and they're not pulling the oars. And uh, you've got to cover the expenses that we've incurred taking care of these people. Oh, my God. Well, it wasn't long before the people relocated back to Plainfield. <laughs> now, uh, they came from the Meriden 
neighborhood in Plainfield. It's the village on the east side of Plainfield Township. You can go up to Columbia, New Hampshire today. There is a neighborhood up there called Meriden Hill. And people in Columbia, when I went up there to research that, they had no idea where that came from. They always puzzled. Why would it be called Meriden Hill rather than something else? And I said, well, you had some poppers up here. Of course, up there, they said, aha, glad they went back to Plainfield. That was good. <laughs> so there. <clears throat> Um, uh, in, in New Hampshire in 1821, Governor Levi Woodbury, he was, uh, he was, uh, he was qu a quite progressive guy, and he was really concerned about the increasing cost of caring for paupers, and uh, uh, he thought something needed to be done to, to turn this whole situation around. And what he proposed was uh, uh, to consolidate uh, the poor people in one location. There's my thing. Aggregate them. Put them in one place. And get rid of the whole thing about settlement. There's wherever you are right now, you're entitled to welfare. You get it right here from whichever town you're in. But it was too radical. He was reluctant to harm the innocents, uh, particularly widowed mothers, of which there were many. Uh, well, they were uh, ab uh, abandoned mothers, oftentimes. There were many, many instances of where a, a, a couple, they had some children and the man of the house would abscond, he would be gone. And they didn't have the infrastructure we have today to chase down deadbeat dads. They'd just be gone and, and the, the sing, basically left a single mother with children. And it was a, a you know, just terrible problem. But the governor at that time, he was really worried about the, the harm that could be brought upon these people if you, you did some radical thing. And he, um, he wanted to help them, but he said, we want to be able to cut off those reduced to want by indolence or extravagance, especially those from the haunts of intemperance. We don't want to have support people who are drunks. Anyway. Um, it, it didn't go. It, it, it just, you know, nothing happened. Uh, Woodbury threw in the towel and he was gone soon. But the idea of an almshouse connected to an agricultural enterprise to reduce costs uh, caught on the beginning of about 1828. And it caught on all over New England. Uh, the people thought, hey, you know, what Woodbury was proposing was probably a pretty good idea. But connect it to a farm like the Plainfield Selectmen thought, thought they could do. And uh, pretty soon you had towns everywhere. Yeah? Is that what the county home is? That's later. I'll, I'll come to that. That's the 1870s. Um, that was when the towns punted the thing. They, they, they'd had it with town farms. And that's what happened. I'll, I'll get right to it. Hold on. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, uh, the laws were passed, Montpelier and Concord, that paved the way for towns to buy farms and set up town farms, or poor farms, whatever you want to call it. And uh, by 1832, all over both states, and in Maine and in Massachusetts, uh, towns were buying farms. Claremont, Claremont in 1833, bought a farm. And they settled uh, their poor people there. And they bragged in, the, in this uh, report uh, for 1834 about the dramatic reduction in costs. They bought the farm for $3,500, and it cut the welfare cost the following year from $800 down to $48. Now, this was a great idea, um, they thought. And so did a lot of other people. Uh, farms produced substantial portions of the food for their residents, and they had some cash sales. A tip, I've, I've looked at a lot of records of these poor farms, and very typical. They would have a team of horses, and they'd have two or three teams of oxen. Now, why is that, you suppose? Well, I argue it's because of this. We, in our culture, do not eat horse meat. If you want to eat horse meat, go to Belgium. You think you're getting beef, you may well be getting horse meat over there, but not here. So, a horse comes to the end of the line, we're not going to eat it. But an ox comes to the end of the line, that's beef. We're, we're happy to eat beef. And so that's, that's the bias towards uh, bovines over equines, I think. Um, the farms would invariably have a few cows. A cow is a marvelous machine. Uh, it does all kinds of wonderful things for humankind. It produces storable fat and protein for the human diet. 
uh, fat and protein that can be salted in the form of cheese and butter and stored for long periods of time. The cow's uh, uh, flesh uh, it because it can be smoked, or salted, become meat and uh, part of the human diet. Um, the cow produces offspring. Uh, she produces leather uh, from her hide. She produces offspring. If it's female, it helps grow, the little calf grows up, grows the herd. If it's a male, it can be castrated and becomes an ox. And oxen were the primary means of motive power for agriculture and forestry and transport in much of, of northern New England way into the late 1900s. And, uh, uh, and then, of course, they had a few sheep and the wool. Uh, uh, people in the house have something to do, they spin, that's the term homespun, you've heard. And then they had hogs, hogs are another marvelous machine. Uh, hogs uh, they can use up, uh, eat up surplus uh, vegetables, fruit, uh, forage in the woods for acorns, they do all kinds of things. And then when you slaughter the hogs, you are able to use everything but the squeal, as they say. You know, every aspect, uh, you laugh, you know, pickle pig's feet, head cheese, on and on. Uh, there's something there for everybody. Um, and they have turkeys, they have hens, uh, and uh, they always brag about their inventories of potatoes. And I see some that just astonished me. They had, uh, and this would usually be on the December 31st. They'd say they had 200 bushels of potatoes in storage. Uh, I don't know how the heck they did it, because they didn't have any pesticides to kill the potato beetles. They had to go out and pick them off by hand. Uh, they had to hoe everything by hand, otherwise the weeds would take over. Uh, just amazing what they were able to do. And uh, they had uh, uh, cider. And cider was safer to drink than the water in many instances, and very common. Give hide cider to five, six-year-old kid if he's thirsty. That's what they did. Cider was safe to drink. And the wells, uh, they didn't understand about microbiology, but after a while they figured out you drink cider, you don't get the stomach bug, uh, you drink water from the well, uh, you, may, uh, you may regret it. Uh, salt pork, uh, you got all these pigs, you got salt pork, uh, you got the little fat from the pig, you know, render it, you got lard, that's the shortening, tallow for uh, uh, candles, cheese, various grains, or, and then large stocks of cordwood. Uh, burning wood, they had endless demand for cordwood. Everybody, if they had, didn't have something else to do, head for the woods, chop down trees, and put up cordwood. That was a huge undertaking. Uh, the town farms were in it, uh, any labor they had. The able-bodied would work on the farm, uh, but in some instances, they had more labor than they had enough work for them to do, so they'd hire people out. Uh, in Hanover, the town farm was where the reservoir is now. Uh, and uh, there was a great big sawmill right next door. And they had some surplus labor on hand at the town farm, send them over to the sawmill. They stick a lumber, move slabs, do that kind of work. And the sawmill would pay wages, but the money went to the town. It didn't go to the laborers. And uh, so <laughs> the way it was, they signed over all their possessions to the town when they went to the town farm. When you went to the poor farm, you signed over your undergarments, your stockings, anything you had that might have even a smidgen of value became town property for so long as you were bound there. Um, I got, uh, it wasn't, uh, uh, from Orford, Here, here's just a quick review of some of the things that they, uh, they purchased. This is in 1850 for the town farm. Now, obviously, at this town farm in Orford, they were uh, providing school for children because they bought two town spellers, whatever those are, a couple of readers, geography books, 22 pairs of shoes and boots, rum, brandy, and gin for the sick. Uh, yes. Um, they tried some bulk purchasing, obviously. They bought uh, 42 gallons of molasses, 50 pounds of coffee, 20 pounds of tea, 100 pounds of salt cod, 150 pounds of sugar, and uh, not all drudgery, though. They bought snuff, a pound and a quarter of white snuff, a pound and three quarters of yellow snuff, three quarters of a pound of LL snuff, 45 pounds of tobacco, and 24 pipes. 
uh, pest control. They, had, they bought a mouse trap and strychnine and a bottle of bed bug poison. Uh, <laughs> yes, sir. And drugs, some of the darndest things they bought. A quarter pound of opium. Uh, patent medicines, Jane's expectorant, Davis's painkiller, two boxes of Ayers pills, and all that. They're just amazing. Uh, uh, and so it, it, it goes on, you know, it's just fun. Well, anyway, uh, as early as 1835, some people were beginning to have second thoughts about this this great experiment that everybody was, was so excited about. And one of them was a man named Reverend Dr. Charles Burroughs. He was rector of St. John's Church in Portsmouth, the Episcopal Church down there, and it still stands. In 1835, he wrote a monograph, I guess you'd call it. He called it a Discourse on Pauperism. And he made a point to distinguish between poverty and pauperism. We kind of use the terms interchangeably. But he said, poverty results from our misfortunes, not our faults. And this deserves our kindest commiseration. Pauperism results from willful error or vicious habits, a misery of human creation. That was his take on it. And he, he, he said, relief to the poor is charity, but the relief of pauperism, though in many cases unavoidable, and where refused would be apparently inhumane, seems to generate evil in a tenfold degree. Uh, anyway, he said, seeking the best method of supporting the poor, let it never be supposed that it is safe, wise, Christian, and humane to do nothing. And uh, he wrote on and on about this, and it was, it was quite interesting. But he, he was becoming disillusioned, but he was really ahead of his time. It wasn't until the 1850s when widespread disillusionment with this experiment, this, this whole approach, was setting in. There were bad conditions at many of these, these farms, um, and leading to investigations, uh, concern, or just, just being ignored. But uh, uh, the biggest problem, of course, was disease. And this was at the time when consumption was the worst, most dreaded disease tuberculosis, and they had no understanding of how tuberculosis would spread, and they would do the absolute opposite of what should have been done. When somebody started showing signs of uh, oncoming tuberculosis, the coughing and spitting and all, they would confine everybody in a hot room, and the, the, the person there sneezing and coughing. Uh, the pathogen that causes tuberculosis, easily aerosol, so spread it all around the room, everybody's breathing it in. And so they just have widespread death. Uh, our records in Plainfield talk about the 1840s. There, there would be times when they couldn't make coffins fast enough. They were just being, you know, families being devastated by, by tuberculosis. And then you had other diseases as well, you know, all kinds of, of things. And, uh, and so those, those conditions, and uh, um, you know, that was a big problem. Um, savings began to fade. They didn't make as much, uh, save as much money as everybody was, was claiming initially. Um, and there was quite a lot of uh, corruption. Um, you can imagine, uh, petty corruption. Uh, imagine there's those 200 bushels of potatoes are up at the town farm and you're an unethical selectman. And, mm, well, I haven't got many potatoes. So I'll hook up the horse and wagon. We'll go up and check on the farm, see how things are going. And mysteriously, a couple bags of potatoes land in the back of the wagon. I didn't see them until I got home. You know, <laughs> you know, theft, basically. Um, uh, but then, probably most, what would become the most port, potent thing was this. This was the early 1850s, and from the pulpits, particularly of congregational churches, was coming the, the abolitionist view. And people then began to say, hey, wait a minute. We're saying how evil the plantation owners in South Carolina are for their treatment of the black slaves, the Negroes. Here we are, here in Vermont, here we are in New Hampshire, and we're enslaving people in the same manner. We make them our charges, and they have no way of getting freedom unless they have a rich relative that p pities them or something. Um, how, how can, we're, we're being hypocritical. This is not right. This is a form of slavery that we're uh, imposing on these people. 
Because you realize when you, if you were a pauper, if you couldn't pay your bills, you went to the town farm, you signed over everything you owned down to your, your socks and your undergarments. Those became town property. And that was what was happening. And also, another aspect is, not only were paupers housed in these facilities, but they became dumping grounds for petty criminals, a misdemeanor criminal. They'd, a judge would send him to work at the, at the town farm, you know, work off his penalty. Uh, they housed the insane. Uh, the town farm house in Plainfield had a cell in the basement with um, uh, four inch by four inch rock maple bars for uh, uh, controlling the maniac. All right, so we had a maniac in our midst. We put him in this incredible cell. And then there were oftentimes would be some orphan children uh, be housed there. So they, they weren't pretty places by any means. Um, so uh, this time of uh, disillusionment was setting in, but there was a time out for the Civil War. They were all the focus on everything became the Civil War. And during the Civil War, there was an expectation that the town farms were going to be uh, just besieged by widows and orphan children. Uh, but as it turned out, it didn't happen because both at the federal and state level, uh, pensions were passed for uh, uh, veterans and widows and, and surviving children. And, uh, but after uh, 1866 or so, town said, ah, we've had it with this. Let's get out of it. And we're going to close it down, sell it, put the money in the general fund, ship the problem to the county, okay, up the street, down wherever, county seat. Let the county figure out what can be done. Well, the counties would soon have all the same problems. They had. Uh, uh, problems. And they became, more, increasingly as time went on, became old folks' homes. Uh, they have uh, elderly, uh, they, no family wants to care for them. Uh, the town just says, we'll send them to the county home, the county farm. And I have to uh, ask your forgiveness, I don't know where the county farm home was in Windsor County. But there was one in Rutland County, I know, because I've read some material about that. But in Sullivan County, it was in Unity. Grafton County was up in Haverhill. Um, so anyway, you ship the problem uh, to the county. Uh, there again, part of my theme, you know, if we can push the problem somewhere else. But that, that whole philosophy of shipping the problem somewhere else is, is just incredible. Um, to give you an example, um, when I was, I was a selectman back in the late 60s, early 70s, and in New Hampshire we still had to give assistance on request and then figure out later, uh, is there some other way, should they, be, should they be on a state program, whatever. But I might be sitting down for supper on Saturday night and knock at the door and uh, open the door and there's a gentleman there, he says, I live in a trailer park and we're out of uh, kerosene. Uh, we haven't got any heat, it's cold. Uh, I gotta have some help. So you give him an order to go to Lebanon with five gallon cans and get some kerosene, get the heat back on. Or it might be a mother come and say, I don't have anything to feed my kids tonight. And you give them an order, 25 bucks, go to the store, buy some beans, hot dogs, you know, get something for the, feed those kids. You gotta do it. All right, so we've done that and that might be Saturday. Well, Monday morning, uh, if I was overseer of the poor, as they were called at the time, it was my obligation to try to figure out uh, where those people come from, I wonder. All right, make a few calls around town. Well, you know where that guy came from? Oh, he used to live in the infield? Well, get on the phone, call up Arthur Blaine, chairman of the selectmen in the infield. Arthur, got some of your people over here. We're out 50 bucks. Uh, you send us a check. Arthur say, oh, what's the name? Give him a name. Oh, oh, they came from Canaan. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this, this is going on all the time. And there was a famous character down at Walpole. Uh, he was selectman for many years in the 1950s, named Louis Ballum. And uh, he'd be in the town office, uh, town hall in Walpole, and somebody would show up, they want some assistance. He'd say, okay, sure. He said, go out and get in my car. I'll be right out. And they'd go out and sit in his car. And he'd come out and he'd start up the motor. 
he'd drive up to North Walpole, cross over the river on the Vilas Bridge to Bellows Falls, pull up in front of the Rockingham Town Hall. Right there, you go in there, they got good welfare. <laughs> well, Vermont always has been a little more liberal with assistance. So, you know, there we are, we're exporting the problem, getting it out. Just, they're doing just like they did with warning them out of town. You know, we're picking them up and carrying them away. So, I mean, it, it sounds ridiculous today, but that's what went on. I mean, it's shameful when you think about it. Uh, good, all right, uh, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Uh, I will <coughs> talk to you about the, uh, what happened when the counties took over. I mean, uh, in, um, anybody ever heard of the Royal Order of the Moose? Moose are like the Elks, like the uh, Odd Fellows. Yes. They had one down at Claremont, uh, basically a drinking club. Uh, it, it, was, it, it faded out here two years ago. They couldn't pay the taxes, so they went down the tube. Which one was that? There was a drinking club. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 35. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the moose, uh, from the time they were organized in the late 19th century, they have always taken the welfare of children as their cause. And in 1922, they were getting these alarming reports about these horrible conditions on county farms in New England. And so they set up a study, and they dispatched people to go to each county farm. They went to the one in Rutland, they came back with a report, said the conditions there are so vile, the clergy refused to go there to administer sacraments. That's pretty sinister, really. Um, here in, in New Hampshire, a lot of bad reports, but I'll just read Hillsborough County. Everybody in New Hampshire loves to beat up Hillsborough County. I mean, they're a villainous county. Uh, they're the biggest and the most arrogant. Every Manchester, Nashua, <clears throat> we hate them. You know, the teams, if you can beat a Manchester team, you lose all the rest of the season, but the season was a success. Uh, anyway, so anyway, here's a report for Hillsborough County from the Order of the Moose in 1922. At Hillsborough County, the, the county farm and home down in um, what's called Grassmere. It's uh, right between Goffstown and Manchester. Um, it's a combination of jail with 91 prisoners, a poor house with 280 inmates, an insane asylum with 11 inmates, county hospital with 92 patients, maternity cases average 50 a year, 20, 38 children now there ranging from infancy to nine years, some illegitimate, either others orphans or deserted, most of them are subnormal, several bright looking, they receive no training, they are not even taught to play. Infected persons associate with other inmates. A woman with facial cancer sleeps in the woman's dormitory and eats with other inmates. The clothes of the infected go into the regular wash. One of the wards of the poor farm building is set aside as a nursery for children. Politics curse this institution. Superintendents usually hold the job for about one term, two years, as good service does not mean continued service. Indifference is the rule. And so that was, there was a lot of problems with those. But slowly uh, down into my lifetime, you know, from the middle of the 19th, 20th century, uh, things got better on those county farms. And uh, most of them, uh, uh, well, they all but one transition out of farming. There's only one New Hampshire county farm left, and that's up in Haverhill. And they have a fabulous dairy herd. It has a 31,000 pound herd average. They have pigs. They grow huge amounts of squash and pumpkins and vegetables, which they use to feed the residents of the nursing home, the prisoners. And then they have huge amounts that they give to food banks all over the county. Uh, but the rest of the counties have all just gotten out of farming completely. And, uh, fallowed their land or leased it out to local farmers or whatever. So uh, uh, that's, that's what happened to the farm. But in general, I will say the county farms are, and the county homes that we have today, they're basically nursing homes. They're pretty good. They're, they're pretty good. Uh, some of these other nursing homes that are around, and you people have all have been reading in the paper, that's happening all over. Uh, I read the Boston Globe just about every day. And there are always stories in there about these uh, 
these um, you know, hedge fund guys or whatever buying up independently owned nursing homes. And when they take possession, first thing they do is cut staff, cut back on the quality of the food, yes. uh, poor quality uh, medical supplies, everything. And they're beginning to have some real problems of, of uh, basically neglect. But these county homes are pretty darn good. Uh, I visit the one in, in Sullivan County. I have a couple of neighbors that I see down there. And uh, people are very, very kind and considerate to them. And they're living the best life that they can possibly expect, I think. Uh, what, changed, what changed the, what altered it when the county farms came into the county of what you were reading yeah. about yeah. all these conditions, and then you said it, they started to get better. What, what, what? In New Hampshire, court orders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, people began advocates for the mentally uh, ill or uh, the, the impoverished elderly. Be awareness. Yeah, but yes, a real awareness. And the state had some institutions as well. They had mental hospitals. In the 19, early 1970s, the New Hampshire Mental Hospital had 2,500 people, residents. And right at that time, the psychotropic drugs began to come on the market. And initially, they'd say, you know, somebody in, you know, with serious issues, here's a, a couple of prescriptions, take them, get out of here, you're gone. And they became what we call today homeless people. And they were all around Concord. It was an awful problem. Uh, and that was happening all over America, really. Uh, but the court orders, uh, you know, went after uh, the state, and it happened in other states. In, New in Massachusetts, they have a place called Bridgewater State Hospital, one of the most notorious anywhere in the country for mistreatment of inmates and everything. Terrible. And they've had court order after court order, lawsuits, and on and on. And they're still fighting over it. So anyway, well... Any other questions? I'm just going to wrap it up. And, you have uh, about the history of the poor farm in Hartford. Well, let's hear about it. I don't have much about it. I don't, but I think there's some people here that can talk a little bit about oh, it. Oh, please, yeah. We were expecting to have Art Peel with us. He's done quite a bit of research into this. Go, and it? his wife keeps jumping yeah. to drop off the cookies. Yeah. And she said he isn't feeling well, so oh, unfortunately. Really? But Martha knows where some of them are. Well, I just read in Tucker's book, you know, and it was... Um, get up there, Martha. Yeah. Get up there. No, I don't want to get up here. I'll get up here. <laughs> but anyway... Speak louder. Uh, and so that's where it, it told a lot of stories about it. And Mary wrote an article in our newsletter this time that kind of said what I told her I read, and she took Tucker's book home and read it too, so there is an article in here about some of the facts that When did the poor farm close up on Town Brown area? And when what? Did, when, when did the poor farm close? I, I don't know exactly that. I think it was not, it was somewhere in the 50s, I think. Uh, I so. We picked up a couple of old uppers there to work on the farm about in the late 40s. Yeah. Yeah. Is up off a of, off a down farm road. Yeah, right? yeah. That's, yeah. Right. yeah. See, that's that yeah. picture. Yeah. Dallas, and you go up that way, and it, I think we found the barn, we did, yeah. and people are living in it. But the house, I believe, I think it was burned, burned down. Burned down. Yeah. But yeah. I don't know any more than that. The barn yeah. has been made into a home. What was yeah. the history of when it was first established? I do not know. I don't no know friends. who ran it. Uh, you're talking I, about Queechee? Yeah. I'm yeah. talking on the town farm, which you go up past, you go up to the Dallas residence was, and you go up up in there, and then I think there's the Newton Road, is that right? Yeah. And then you go up to, it's town farm road. We went up yeah. there, yeah. we took a picture well, of the farm. It's in our newsletter. It's, it's in the newsletter. That's in Dover. Pardon? It's up in the Dover. No. 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 We no. found the Queechee West Harford Road. West Harford Road. I think they went to Okay, folks, I'll, I'll wrap it up quick and we can talk some more. Uh, so anyway, I, I just ask you to consider those enduring themes that I tried to uh, portray here, the differentiation the worthy and versus the helpless, poor, the honest. Uh, we all agree in our hearts, I think, is 
uh, community, uh, you know, today, uh, that those those people deserve our, our help. But uh, the vagrant, vicious poor, oh, we are pretty much united that we really don't want to help those people. Uh, the settlement business is, is absurd, in the, uh, and based on what we know today, all this foolishness. Uh, but uh, we have a little of that in modern times, uh, venue shopping. You know, they know a, a welfare director in Claremont can be a kind of a soft touch. We'll kind of migrate over to Claremont and we can get a little bit better assistance, but you know, not, it's not big money. The lodging the poor, aggregating them, you know, we talked about boarding them out, and then town farms, county farms, county homes, and look what we have today in modern times. We got homeless shelters, you got a fabulous one right here in town, that's a place that aggregates the poor. Uh, in Manchester and Boston and Point South, you have housing projects. A lot of them went up in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, big, ugly tower buildings, um, often uh, riddled with crime and problems. Um, we have these Medicaid nursing homes. There is a place where you aggregate poor people, and, and uh, we try to afford them the care there. And then, of course, we got prisons. We got a lot of people in prisons. Most of them are poor, and uh, there they are. Compulsory labor. Um, we heard about auctions and contracts and hard labor for idlers, work them on the farm. Uh, today we have uh, unemployment benefits. Uh, I don't know what it is in Vermont, but in New Hampshire, if you're on unemployment, you have to go and check in every two weeks. And the first question you have to answer is, were you ready and available for work at all times during the previous two weeks? And they are empowered to say, you know, you get a job. And here's a form. You go out and show us that you're trying to get a job. And then they go to an employer and they say, no, I haven't got any job today. They'll always want you to sign it. But that, that's what we do. It's OK. In 1996, Gingrich and Clinton got together and passed legislation, which has resulted in about a 50% decline in the number of persons eligible, qualified to receive welfare assistance through public programs. And it's called welfare to work law, where they have to get a job or they have to go to school to get skills so they can get a job. I mean, it's had a tremendous impact uh, all over the country. Um, another interesting thing, I, you know, I, did, I knew this was out there, but I never thought about it in the context, is Social Security. In, the, in Social Security in 1934, 35, 36, it was just like Obamacare today. You know, all this crazy argument back and forth, and it was socialism, or we've got to do it. You know, it was, it was a terrible, terrible fight. But it passed Congress when it was emphasized that there were millions and millions of older women in this country that had no uh, transferred pension from their late husband uh, and they had no resources, and they were they were not uh, they were a very uh, sympathetic uh, audience for assistance from the federal government. So, Social Security became law, and the first check came to a Vermont woman, uh, was it in Ludlow. Yeah, Ida Fuller. Right? Ida Fuller. What was it? Twelve dollars or something? Something like that. Yeah. 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 Very yeah. No, I mean, you know, it had a true, imagine, imagine without it today, where we'd be, it would be just horrible. But uh, I'm very proud that uh, Roosevelt called up a guy who had been governor of New Hampshire twice and said, would you come down and get this social security program going? His name was John Wynant. He was an amazing man. And he got the social program, security program going and he later became the American ambassador to Great Britain during World War II. He worked with Winston Churchill. And uh, uh, the poor man suffered from terrible depression and he committed suicide in 1947. And it was, he was almost forgotten until a wonderful book was written about him and uh, Edward R. Murrow and Winston Churchill and the influence that they had. You know, it was amazing. And finally, the state of New Hampshire, they're going to have a statue of him on the state house lawn, you know, overdue by half a century. Anyway, so I will conclude by saying, arguing, I think you'll agree with me, uh, that probably our grandchildren's grandchildren will be wrestling with a lot of these same issues in their time. I want to ask you a question. Yeah. Here in Vermont, we had overseers of the poor, mm -hmm. and they were 
Um, every town in Vermont had an overseer of the poor. Mm -hmm. and apparently, it was very arbitrary. <laughs> the individual will determine what you may have. Yeah. And it was entirely up to him. Yeah. Yeah. Whether you got yeah. a little or yeah. a lot or whatever. Yeah. Did New Hampshire have overseers of the poor? Yes, absolutely. And then it, uh, by law, it got changed to overseers of welfare. Yeah. Now most towns call it a human resources director or but something I think like that. About 19, yeah. Somewhere in the 1960s. Yeah. That, right. that ceased. Yeah. And the state yeah. took over. Yeah. I, I was overseer of the poor for a couple of terms. The, the old time selectmen, they always make the rookie selectman be overseer of the poor. So <laughs> that was my duty for a couple of years. And we also had, we had uh, surplus foods, they call it, commodities from USDA. And once a month, we'd get an allocation. We joined up with Cornish, and we'd have a dis distribution night. And the people would all come, they'd have a, a grain bag or something, they'd get this, you know, butter, a five pound block of cheese, pressed meat, flour, sugar, all these things. But there was one thing that they got, this was back in the early 70s, was lentils. Nobody knew what the hell lentils were. What the heck is that? And, and the people would go out in the parking lot and they'd batter back around and around. And one guy, he'd take all the lentils and swap, you know. And I asked him one time, what do you do with those? He said, oh, I take them out, I feed them my chickens. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, I love that. Yeah. Well, anybody got something they want to throw in for discussion here? Or, well, I looked at that clock and I said, boy, I didn't know I was that long winded. Oh. Every minute was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah.